For most of us, a Pacific island paradise is the fantasy world of luxury vacation commercials or nostalgic old movies. But for Tony de Brum and the people of the Marshall Islands, where he now serves as foreign minister, the reality has been very different. Their Pacific island paradise meant enduring 67 atomic bombs detonated by the US government during the Cold War. That is the equivalent of exploding 1.6 Hiroshima-sized bombs every day for 12 years. Tony de Brum was just a young boy fishing with his grandfather when he witnessed something that no child should ever experience. The Castle Bravo shot of March 1, 1954, which was the biggest atomic detonation in history, equivalent to 1,000 Hiroshima's. Everything turned red. The ocean, the fish, the sky, and my grandfather's net, Tony recalled many years later. And we were 200 miles away from ground zero, a memory that can never be erased. As the years passed, Tony de Brum learned of another reality, that those atomic explosions, misnamed tests, were in fact part of an experiment on the people of the Marshall Islands, a cruel, callous and deliberate experiment to find out what would happen to people living in a highly radioactive environment, to people described by one US official as, quote, more like us than mice, unquote. Yeah. An experiment that has led to an epidemic of birth defects, cancers, and other often fatal maladies. In effect, a war crime. Today, while still confronting the legacy of those atomic atrocities, the Marshallese face yet another threat as their low-lying islands begin to sink beneath the waves, a consequence of sea level rise due to climate change. Tony de Brum has taken on the two biggest planetary threats of our time and made it his life's work to find solutions. On the nuclear weapons side, he has asked for one simple act of morality, get rid of them, because, as he says, it is in the interest of the very survival of humanity that nuclear weapons are never used again under any circumstances, and the truly universal way to accomplish this is true through the total elimination of such weapons. His leadership has led to two landmark lawsuits filed by what he has called the tiny little nobody nation of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. The lawsuits charge all nine nuclear armed nations for failing to comply with their obligations under international law to pursue negotiations for the worldwide elimination of nuclear weapons. These lawsuits have been filed in the International Court of Justice in The Hague and in the US Federal District Court in San Francisco under the auspices of the Nuclear Zero Campaign, which states, the Republic of the Marshall Islands acts for the seven billion of us who live on this planet to end the nuclear weapons threat hanging over all humanity. Everyone has a stake in this. On climate change, Tony de Brum has been calling at the UN and elsewhere for immediate action and fast track assistance for the Marshall Islands sitting just two meters above sea level. And where climate change is not a coming threat, but as Tony says, a present crisis. Not surprisingly, we are by no means the first to celebrate this man's steadfast commitment to a better world. Among other awards, Tony has received the 2012 Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's Distinguished Peace Leadership Award, and next month, he will receive the Right Livelihood Honorary Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. When one of my daughters found out I was making this presentation, she said something to the effect that she wished she could do it. And knowing how much of a tradition these awards have for spontaneity, I said, why not? So here she is to say a few final words. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tu Yat, and I am 14 years old. I wanted to take this opportunity as a young person to thank you, Mr. De Brum, for all you are doing to make this world a safer place for my generation and for our children. I want the world to be a place where we can all be happy and healthy and not have to worry about nuclear war and runaway climate change. We are so grateful for all you are doing. Your work is a gift to us and to the seven generations. 
and we are honored to present Tony DeBroom with the Nuclear Free Future Award for Solutions. I said that a long time ago when Captain Cosby and his explorer friend Shamizu arrived in the Marshall Islands on a Russian ship that started off in Russia and traveled to Alaska, ending up in the northern marshes. When they went ashore, the local chiefs, paramount leaders, greeted them. And their first question to our paramount chiefs was this, what do you call this place? Expecting to hear the exotic name of some Pacific island, this place, what do you call this place? The answer from a scantily clad high chief who was cutting coconuts for them to drink was Island Kainar. What was that? Island Kainar. They did not realize that for our people at that time, there was no need for a name. Why would they need a name? The answer that they gave the explorers was Island Canaan, literally, our land, our islands. Island literally means the top of an upswelling of current. It means where Earth meets the sky, where the ocean meets the sky. It is also translated as my soul. Many years later, Captain Marshall and Captain Gilbert, after dropping off special cargo in Australia and New Zealand, cargo that they brought from the United Kingdom, England at the time, ventured northward and discovered the Gilbert and the Marshall Islands. Gilbert being named after Captain Gilbert and the Marshall being named after Captain Marshall. But until then, we were always island Canada and many of our colleagues throughout the Pacific, especially my good brothers from Micronesia and Palau, our islands. No one can take that away from us. No nuclear weapon can take that away from us. No strong country with money and tanks and warships can take that away from us. It is always ours. And the way we describe it <coughs> is that we belong to the land. We are here to keep it in good shape for our children, and our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. That is the union of man and man and sea. <coughs> The threats of nuclear weapon and the description of all that they do or promise to do if we're not careful have been described by the most eloquent speakers earlier. So I will not talk about that. I will talk rather about people, the people in the marshes who have had that experience without there being a war. People who can testify to you the insanity of nuclear weapons without having to go through the scourge of a nuclear war. People who to this day must endure in a disproportionate manner the evil and the insanity of these weapons. I now introduce the last member of my body, 
obě chyba. Obět is a young foreign service officer in our small Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He comes from the island of Bikini. But he's never been there. His grandfather brought him up because his parents could not go back to Bikini, and he's lived all his life away from his homeland. His soul has never been able to repatriate. Hard worker, a smart young man, and I'm sure that when we no longer carry the flags and the banners that we carry today, he, like our young people from Canada, will take over. This morning, Obed and I had occasion to sit with the Department of Interior to discuss a current and present problem in the Marshall Islands. In 1946, when the people of, an, of Bikini were evacuated to make room for the bomb, they were taken first to an atoll called Romeri, where they nearly starved to death. Subsequently re-evacuated to Kwajalein, treated, and when they were well enough to fend for themselves, Koko, they were taken to this uninhabited, single island, no lagoon, non-atoll, island called Kili, K-I-L-I. -I. And there they have lived since their removal. For many years they lived near starvation, could not obtain food or supplies, and sometimes actually un underwent thirst and hunger. They managed to survive those early years of of uh, exile in Kili by weaving little baskets from coconut leaves and pandanus leaves, coconut fronds and pandanus leaves. Those baskets are now very popular still in the Pacific and are known as Kili bags. I'm sorry that I don't have an ex example to, to show, or do I? No. <laughs> but. <clears throat> The reason we were talking about Kili this morning at the Interior Department is because they have now petitioned, and I delivered the petition to the United States several months ago. They have now petitioned to be removed from Kili and to be resettled elsewhere. There is no more land in the marshals to resettle on. The land that belong, they belong to is no longer capable of nourishing human life. So they want to be resettled in the United States using their resettlement funds. But why the change of heart these many years after 1946? They've done well in Kili, have they not? Have they not survived these many years? Well, two stories. One. They were asked to move back to Bikini. They were told Bikini was safe. Mm. I was the young interpreter that conveyed that message. They heard that from my mouth. I was speaking for the U.S. representatives there. You may now go back to Bikini because it is now safe for you to return. Half, about half of them thought that was a good idea. The other half did not. Nevertheless, those who that, that agreed to, went back, to go back went back, and we dutifully packed them, put them on a ship, and sailed with them to Bikini. When they were leaving the island of Kili, they composed a song, Father which reads, So goodbye to you who stay behind. Too bad you're not going with us to Bikini. Too bad you don't sail with us back to Bikini. We took them and left them off in Bikini. A village had been built for them, houses and water catchments and baseball fields. Two years later, 
I was also called to go to tell these people who had been repatriated. Whoops, sorry. The scientists from the Department of Energy have discovered that you have too much cesium and strontium in your urine. So therefore, we'll have to take you back to Kitty. <coughs> because they felt so ashamed that they had believed what was told to them by the authorities and the scientists, they did not want to go back to Kitty. And we felt that they had a right to feel that way. For song, for taunting. Nah, you're not going, I'm going. So, the government set aside a small island in the Majuro Lagoon called Egypt, where these people who would not go back to Chile after spending two years in Guinea would be resettled. So in the past two decades, Kili has been combined with Bikini and Egypt as the election district of KBE, Kili, Bikini, Egypt. One story. Second story. Kili was never inhabited in the first place because it's not capable of supporting human habitation. It has no lagoon to fish. It stands alone in the middle of nowhere. There is a, there is a uh, dependency on a, other atoms to support it, but the people of Bikini have no choice. For, after experiencing many a high wave season where we could not service the island by ship, it was decided in order to safely keep them there, we would have to build an airstrip on Kili, which we did. So when it was too rough to service them by ship, we could service them by air. Starting about the beginning of last year, with high waves breaking over the island and high tides inundating the surface of the island through waves breaking over the embankment, we started saying, hey, this is getting ridiculous. We may have better think about doing something about uh, the land and the landing area of the ships as well as the landing strip for the plane. But something more phenomenal happened. Now, in the out of the dirt of Kili today is springing up salt water through the land, not from the ocean, but up through the land. So the food crops have ceased to produce. The airstrip cannot be used safely. The landing area for ships and launches is unusable because now the prevailing wind does not come from the east anymore, but comes from the west. So where the, the landing area for shipping was built is no longer usable. The people are totally dependent on imported food, but cannot get it. So, we have worked with them to arrange for their, once again, a second exile. <clears throat> Not only has the nuclear testing program created a community of displaced people within their own country, but now we'll begin to create a new community of displaced people outside of their own country with no real power to determine what they can or cannot do. From this end of the continuum, it's a nuclear migration all the way to a climate migration. The two greatest threats against human <coughs> beings today, nuclear weapons and climate change, are manifest in the plight of the Kiri people. <coughs> I dedicate this award to them.
few days before we left Majuro, we buried a beloved leader of the Marshall Islands, Chuvera Zedekiah. Chuvera and I knew each other from the time we were small boys in Majuro. When I went back from school, he was one of my first trainees in what we called a, a uh, on-the-job training program. He, he started off as a pharmacist mate in our local hospital. He went up through the ranks, then had to heed the call of public office because he was of royal blood and became uh, Senator from Majuro, Member of Parliament, later Speaker of the Parliament, and after that, President of my country. Served a term and remained a Senator after that, that service. Turenan was a beloved leader of the people of Majuro and Arno and died much too early. I will not go into details. I will only say that the nation mourns him. We are still in a half flag, half sad uh, mode for 30 days. I also want to remember him in the acceptance of this award. I'm wearing purple, and I know that many others have worn purple. I hope that you remember the month of cancer awareness and remember the women and children of the Marshall Islands. I've said before they have borne a disproportionate uh, amount of, of suffering, uncertainty, fear not knowing for sure what's going to happen next. They are the ones who must decide whether their child or daughter or son should be married to one who may come from a contaminated area. Then what happens if they have children and grandchildren? All of these things are not so manifest in measuring the harm that has been done and the suffering that the people of my islands have had to go through. They are not as easily measured as those leukemias and, and, and uh, thyroid gland uh, cancers and all the others that the scientists like to refer to. But the people who bear the real suffering are the women and the children of the country. I also accept on their behalf. My good friends, my family, and all of those who feel the same way. We must rid this world of this terrible weapon, and we must cooperate to make sure that climate change doesn't engulf us. That is our pledge. That is a pledge that we ask that we all take together moving forward. Thank you very much.